Hello, everyone. My name is Angela Ledgerwood, and it's my great, great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Danao Mangestu. He is a really very important writer. His fiction and nonfiction illuminate the experiences of African immigrants in America. He explores what it means to um, escape a violent homeland in his work, and also what it is to form a new identity in a new land. He's the award-winning author of three novels, All Our Names, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, and How to Read the Air. He has an amazing, um, well, bio, so I'll just whip through it because we want to get to him, so I've kind of condensed it a little bit. He's a graduate of Georgetown University and Columbia University's MFO, MFA program in fiction. He's a recipient of a five under 35 award from the National Book Foundation. He's also a 20 under 40 award winner from the New Yorker magazine. His journalism and fiction have appeared in such publications as Harper's Magazine, Granta, Rolling Stone, The New Yorker and The Wall Street Journal. And it has to be mentioned that he's traveled the world for his journalism as well, to Darfur, uh, Uganda, the Congo, and many other places he might talk about today. He's also a recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, which says a lot about what we might expect. Um, he lives in New York, and it's my great pleasure to introduce him now, Danao Mangestu. Good afternoon. Um, really, the secret joy of doing these things is you get to stand there while someone says these nice things about you, and you think, amazing, I'm an important writer. I feel so happy. Um, all of which aren't really true. Um, but thank you guys for coming here anyway. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be in this very beautiful, lovely place. And um, I brought my kids with me, and they're really happy here. <laughs> so if we don't leave, and you see these very adorable little children walking around your town for the next few years, then you know why. Um, yesterday, I was, I was having a really wonderful conversation with a group of uh, fellow writers who are here at the Sunnyland Center um, around this idea of politics and power and fiction. And, um, and these are sort of things that are, that are very essential and important to why I write and how I sort of come, and how I've come to think about writing. And I realize oftentimes, especially in, in America, we don't always allow these three things to exist together in the same space. We like our novelists and our poets to sort of be kind of over there in pretty little library towers where they think of very nice lyrical sentences. And we like our political writers to be sitting in the room over there, so we've got our, our serious political writers in that room. Um, and for me as a novelist, that's not really the way things sort of work. Oftentimes my work is very much informed by the work I do as a journalist and the work uh, you just sort of do as a person who thinks it's important to be engaged with the world that you live in. So this, um, this talk is as much about my last novel, All Our Names, as it is about how you, I've sort of come to think about my work in general and how I've come to sort of write the way that I do write. And, um, and because it's also, I'm thinking about the timing we're in now in January and what's been happening recently. And, um, you know, and a year ago, we, my wife was friends and we've been living in Paris, or we were living in Paris for a long time. We had a lot of very close friends who were there. And, um, and on January 7th last year, we had very good friends who were working in the Charlie Hebdo office in Paris. And, um, and one of our friends who, who was there in that office that day survived the attack. He took a bullet in the chin and, um, and was able to fortunately still be with us now. And over the past summer, we went to go visit him um, while he was recovering uh, Les Amalites. I can't stand saying those words in French. Um, <laughs> and it was still difficult for him to talk when we saw him. And, um, but we did, and we talked about some of the controversy that surrounded the attack, and especially the controversy as it related to us here in America and how we responded to it. And he acknowledged it was very frustrating um, for a lot of the people who worked at Charlie Hebdo to hear that um, sometimes we in this country felt like the work that was being done there was um, deliberately antagonistic 
problematic in ways that we have a hard time recognizing. But I think now, after what's been happening, um, more and more we understand that what's, what the attack on the Hebdo offices and the attacks that followed in Paris um, more recently in the summertime, um, they were attacks on a very, on a very particular idea. And the, the attacks especially that happened over the summer, they were attacks that happened in the parts of Paris that are the most diverse, the most multicultural, that um, they bring together more segments of this very complicated and fractured society than other communities in Paris do. And I think sometimes we call that, we call that diversity and we call it multiculturalism. And we take those words so easily for granted. And we take them for granted whether we're living in France or in America. And I think sometimes it's because we often forget that these very large and complex societies that we live in are fragile. And they're also miraculous at the same time. But they are fragile and they are also flawed. And perhaps more vulnerable now than they've ever been before. Especially when you look at our current political conversation and the debates that we have or don't seem to properly have anymore. And so recently I've been reading a lot of James Baldwin. Um, and I've been reading Baldwin partly as a response to some of these sort of deep divisions in our own society. And they've been playing out for a very long time, obviously. But in 1960, for a special issue on New York, Esquire asked Baldwin to write about any particular part of the city that he wanted. And so Baldwin decided to write about Fifth Avenue in Harlem. And the essay, Fifth Avenue Uptown, begins almost as a sort of walking tour through the projects of Harlem. And yet almost as soon as you begin the essay, you realize that the writing takes a deliberately curious turn. You suddenly stop walking with Baldwin down the avenue. And almost immediately, you find yourself in this ambiguous, less physically defined space. You realize that suddenly you've stepped off the sidewalk and almost without knowing it, you've walked into the consciousness of an African-American community that Baldwin describes as being hemmed in trapped, caged by what he calls the barbed wire and fish hooks of poverty and discrimination. Baldwin writes this essay on a very, very personal note. He has this wonderful opening line. There is a housing project standing now where the house in which we grew up when once stood. And one of those stunted city trees is starling where our doorway used to be. By the time you get to the end of Baldwin's essay, four brief pages later, that we and the I that stands behind it has grown to something vastly larger. The essay is no longer about Fifth Avenue, and it's not about the projects, or even the violence and the poverty and the desperation and discrimination that shaped so much of the daily life inside of them. No, as Baldwin makes clear, the stakes are much larger than that for him. And so he ends like this. It is a terrible, inexorable law that one cannot deny the humanity of another without diminishing one's own. And the face of one's victim, one sees oneself. Walk through the streets of Harlem and see what we, this nation, have become. And it's the verb see at the very end of that sentence that I linger on the most now. Once you read it, you realize that it casts a shadow back over the entire essay, and it turns Baldwin's story into a request, or an attempt, or an invitation, or better yet, a demand for an entire country to open its eyes and recognize what stands before them. It's no small or easy thing, though, this seeing, and it requires more than just opening our eyes, and it requires this peculiar type of engagement one that moves beyond the surface reality. And it's the type of engagement that we're not always comfortable with, especially when it comes to fiction, or when it comes to novels. We call these stories political novels, and we put them off into the side. About eight years ago, I was doing an event in Algeria, and I was sitting with another journalist, and um, a man in the audience asked me, question after I finished describing the work that I do as a novelist and the places I've traveled to. Um, and he asked me, he said, are you an écrivain engagé? And I stood up and I said, well, of course I am. Look at what I just told you. I, I told you I write about 
displaced communities. I write about places in war. I write about immigration, migration. Of course, of course, I'm a deeply engaged writer. I'm a political writer. And then he asked me, well, if you're such a political writer, if you're such an engaged writer, who's the president of Algeria? <laughs> right now, I also teach in an MFA program in Brooklyn. And the obvious joke is that all of Brooklyn is basically an MFA program. <laughs> and if you live in Brooklyn, you are almost automatically inscribed into an MFA program. It comes with your laptop, a coffee shop. Um, you can choose between screenwriting, poetry, novels. It's, it's a great deal for you there. Um, but on the first day of my, of, of my classes, I give my students an essay by Camus that I came across, thanks to Edward Dantica. And the essay is called Create Dangerously. And, um, and I give it to them because I know it's going to upset them. And I think it's important to upset your MFA students and get them frustrated. And there's this great line, um, paragraph from, from Camus' essay that says, on the poop deck of slave galleys, it is possible at any time and place, as we know, to sing of the constellations while the convicts bend over the oars and exhaust themselves in the hold. It is always possible to record the social conversation that takes place on the benches of the amphitheater while the lion is crunching the victim. And it's very hard to make any objections to the art that has known such success in the past, but things have changed somewhat. And the number of convicts and martyrs has increased over the surface of the globe. And in the face of so much suffering, if art insists on being a luxury, it will also be a lie. Now what makes my students very unhappy about that particular passage is that it seems like Camus is making a demand on them. It seems like he's telling them that the beautiful sentence is no longer enough for the novelist or for the artist. It seems like he's telling them that if they want to write about things that they have to take on a measure of engagement that they don't want. And my graduate students bristle at this. They tell me that they want to write about all the beautiful things that they've seen and that they've known. They tell me that politics don't interest them, and that more importantly, you shouldn't dare mix the two. And then I tell them I know exactly why they say that. Because when I was their age and in graduate school, all I wanted to do was write big, be big, beautiful, universal ideas. And I wanted to write them in sentences that were so dense and so lyrical that no one could understand them. <laughs> and only then would I know that I was a genius. The very first novel I tried writing, I set it in the Midwest, which is where my family came from, came to after we immigrated from Ethiopia. And I gave it what I thought all very important novels needed, a meaningless, pretentious title, a great big flood, and then a pair of brooding young men who were desperate to escape the smallness of their world. For 400 pages, <clears throat> my characters and I use that word very loosely. My characters walked around this very small Midwestern town, digging in old boxes, looking at photographs, staring at each other longingly from across the room, thinking great big thoughts to themselves, like, whatever I do, it will be. And then that would be it. <laughs> they couldn't finish their thoughts because they were so important. And then all the characters in my novel, they had these great familiar names, some of them which were lifted directly out of the Bible. I named my characters Isaac, I named them Bill, I named them Bob. They lived in a nameless town, in an unnamed state, at an unspecified moment in history. And they weren't black, and they weren't white, and they weren't brown. And they had eyes and hair that weren't blue, and they weren't green, or they weren't black. And I wrote that novel over and over for years. And among my friends and I, we called it my flood novel, because the flood was about the only thing that happened over those 400 pages. <laughs> the other 390 pages were spent looking at the sky, wondering when it was going to rain. And when the book was finally done, I sent it out to just about every agent and editor in New York. And finally, after about a year's worth of rejections, I had to finally accept what I knew was probably instinctively true. There was something flawed, empty, hollow about that book. <laughs>
I think there's the, perhaps the greatest difference between my immigrant parents and myself is that they had to slowly and painfully learn to be suspicious of how they were treated and seen in America. When I was growing up, my father used to insist on our Ethiopianness. You are Ethiopian, he would say in English, in our house in the suburbs of Chicago, just as I ran out the door to play basketball and eat a hot dog. And then sometimes he would tease my mother and say, remember, you are a refugee. To which my mother would stomp her feet and say, no, I am not a refugee. I'm Ethiopian. And my mother was smart, of course, and she knew how complicated these words were. She knew that these labels and stereotypes paraded themselves as facts, when in fact, they were not. I once did an event with an English writer who said that the best thing about being from the US or the UK or anywhere in the Western world is that it didn't matter where we went any, or why we went. We were always going to be expatriates. And if I left America today broke in search of shelter, I land in a foreign country and everyone would embrace me as an expat. The truth, though, of course, is that we were refugees. My father left Ethiopia just before I was born, not too long after his brother was arrested and died. He went to Italy and then to America, and he did what countless of other desperate immigrants before him did once he got here. He wrote letters. He wrote to his senator, to his congressman. He had others write letters on his behalf. And in those letters, a particular type of story was being told. We weren't just refugees, but political exiles. And we weren't just political exiles, we were political exiles fleeing a ruthless communist government during the height of the Cold War. We were Christian political exiles fleeing a Soviet-backed government during the height of the Cold War. I never asked my father, but I know he felt blessed to have made it to America. The letters that he wrote asking for us, for my mother and sister and I to come to him, were supported and returned. And when we arrived in America two years after he did to join him at an airport in Peoria, Illinois, there was a story in the local newspaper that said, Christmas comes early for local family. I used to think of my father's daily reminders, remember, you are Ethiopian, were simple declarations of pride, a desire, however desperate, to ensure that his rapidly Americanized children didn't become completely foreign. And by and large, I'm sure that was the dominant reason why he said that. But I suspect that there was another reason buried behind those words, one that's even harder to express even today. Remember you are Ethiopian was another way of saying, remember you are not American. And perhaps more essential to the point, remember you are not black in America. Or remember you are not black American. Which is the phrasing I've heard so often from other African immigrants. I didn't decide I actually wanted to be Ethiopian until I heard someone call me a nigger. And then I could remember all the times I heard my parents' friends complain about the niggers in the neighborhood or in the street or in the car next to them, only to remind me and perhaps themselves in the very next breath that they weren't racist. My father, who only moments of desperation drove beyond the speed limit, once got four speeding tickets in a single afternoon while driving across the state of Ohio. It wasn't until he got the fourth ticket that he began to think, hmm, maybe all those tickets had to do with something other than how fast he was driving and the cost of the car he was leasing. I'm sure it wasn't the first time he had to confront the fact that, regardless of how he thought of himself, there were always those who, in the country he had now lived in for more than three decades, would look at him in an entirely different light. But there is something different between he and myself. He was able to eventually shed that second gaze. He could forget how he was looked at. He could forget its effect and uncoil it from his skin. And for a long time, I tried to do the same thing. I tried to slip out of my American skin. I decided that if America could reject me, then I was going to do the same thing. I refused to become, American, to become an American citizen. I considered myself solely Ethiopian. And I joined my mother, who years earlier had refused to be labeled a refugee. 
There's a problem, though. I lived only in America. I was a product of its cultures, its schools, and it was impossible to reject that without rejecting a huge part of myself. About five years ago, I went to Eastern Congo to report on a war that at that time was entering its 10th year. And it's a war that began shortly after the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, when the same men who were responsible for that crossed the border from Rwanda into Eastern Congo and set up camp. They had killed about 800,000 people, and many of whom bore features similar to mine. And by crossing the border, they were able to avoid a lot of the persecution and prosecution that would have happened had they stayed. As I was doing the story, I knew almost as soon as I crossed the border from Rwanda into Congo, that people began to look at me suspiciously. I was black. I had an African name. But I spoke English like an American, and I carried its passport. According to almost everybody that I met first in Rwanda and then later in Congo, I also had another problem. I looked like someone who the not too distant path, past would have certainly been marked for death. I had this wonderful translator, Caleb, who had adopted 12 children and now supported all of them by working as a fixer for journalists like myself. He would put his big arms around me and he would say, oh, I think we should just stay right here because wherever you go, you're going to have problems because of the way you look. At the same time, the UN soldiers and who were responsible for the country at that time were also worried. It was the 50th anniversary of Congo's independence, and they were concerned that someone like me would be mistaken as a spy or a troublemaker. Before getting on a helicopter for a tiny little village in eastern Congo, the UN even offered me a place to stay so I didn't have too many problems while I was doing my work. And we stayed with them for about two days. And the whole time we did, they kept insisting that absolutely nothing was wrong, that there were no problems anywhere in the area. And finally, after those two days, we decided to drop the UN escort that had been supposedly protecting us. And we decided to drive towards a village where we had heard there had recently been an attack. And when we neared the village, we saw from a distance the burned remains of the military outpost. We saw the soldiers who had been assigned to protect it sitting outside in their shirts and sandals. And we got out of the car, and my translator asked the lieutenant if we could have a few minutes to tell us, so they could tell us what happened. And the man said, of course. So we sat down, and over the course of the afternoon, the lieutenant described how the night before, a group of rebels had come out of the bushes, the burns of the huts where they were living, shot two soldiers and a baby, and then disappeared. After he finished telling me all this, he asked me where I was from. I told him, New York. He looked at me again and he said, no. No, no, where are, you, where are you really from? I said, oh, from Washington, D.C. <laughs> and he said, no, ha ha. No, 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 even, even before that, tell us where you really are. And this time he stopped smiling. And he spoke only to my translator. And he said, tell him I want to know who is he really. After my flood novel failed, I went back to Washington, D.C., where I'd gone to college, and where large parts of my extended family still lived. And I had all these beautiful memories of going to D.C. as a child and watching my father and mother run into these Ethiopian immigrants who had all settled in there. And it seemed like this miraculous thing. You go to D.C., you walk down the street, and suddenly here come your long-lost childhood best friends walking down the street. And I wondered why we didn't just always go there. It's like this was like Christmas every time we came. And one night I was walking down the street on 18th Street pretty sad and despondent because my great big flood novel had been rejected by people like David in New York, and I didn't know what to do with myself. And just before getting home, I looked out the corner of my eye, and it began to seem more and more like a fantasy. Standing there in the corner of a little grocery store was an Ethiopian man, standing under these bright big fluorescent bulbs, under these barren shelves, what I imagined to be a very dirty little dingy shop. And I went home that evening. And I began writing what would become my first published novel, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears. And I knew that there was something different happening almost from the moment I started typing the first sentence. 
But I knew what the difference really was when I got to the end of the first page, and I wrote almost by accident the narrator's name, Saifa Selassie. There's a line from a William Carlos Williams poem, The Red Wheelbarrow, that just always jumps to mind. So much depends on a red wheelbarrow. In this case, so much depends on a name. Saifa Selassie. In Amharic, it means sort of the Holy Trinity, and I know that because that's the name my grandfather wanted to give me when I was born in Ethiopia. Now, I have no memory of my grandfather. He died shortly after we left the country, and he begged my mother to leave me behind so he could have one more chance of having a son. Over the next three years, while I wrote that novel and every novel since, I filled the book with very particular names. I named dictators, revolutionary leaders. I named streets and neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., later cities in Uganda, hotels in Kampala. And I brought all of those things with me to America. I brought my dead uncle, Shibru, who in my first novel was the narrator's father. In the novel, he's taken, beaten, arrested, and eventually killed. And as I wrote his death scenes, I became painfully aware that I was imagining the death of a man who had haunted me all my life. There's a wonderful line from Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping. Facts tell you nothing. Or if anything, it's facts that need explaining. I know the facts about my family's life in Ethiopia and about Africa in general. By the time I've begun my novels, I've always had a small army of facts standing behind me. I knew the dates of Emperor and Haile Selassie's arrests that plunged Ethiopia into civil war. I knew the number of people estimated to have been killed in Eastern Congo during the most recent violence. I knew that Valentine Strasser, 25 years old, was briefly the youngest head of state in the world. I knew that there had been an estimated 180 coups in Africa since the end of the colonial era. I named that first novel Children of the Revolution, which was supposed to be ironic. My publisher let me hold on to it for a few months before calling me one morning and saying that the marketing department had a problem with that title. They said it sounded too political, too unliterary, too unlikely to make its hands into, to make its way into the hands of readers like you. So they said, could I change the title? And of course I said, no. I can't change my title. And then she called me back about five minutes later and reminded me that they could make me change my title. <laughs> so we came up with a compromise. The beautiful things that heaven bears, which is a line that comes from Dante's Inferno. Through a round aperture I saw appear some of the beautiful things that heaven bears. And here's the great thing about Dante's Inferno. It's a catalog of names. It's the most political poem you could ever imagine. Hell is full of politicians. <laughs> that man in Algeria didn't ask me what I thought about the president of Algeria. He didn't ask me if I liked the president of Algeria. He asked me if I knew his name. When that soldier in Congo asked me to tell him who I really was, he was simply stating a fact that only recently, through writing, I've come to accept. I don't stand benignly before you. I stand here, sleep here, eat here, always acutely aware of the oddity of my name, of the differences in our history, and our culture, and the color of our skin. When I was growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, I was reminded of those differences daily, sometimes in violent and explicit form. And when I tried to write that very first flood novel, I thought I was absolving the world of those differences. That novel failed not only because I lacked the talent and maturity, but above all, I lacked the courage and conviction to believe that the stories that I knew, the ones that I had lived, had any meaning beyond myself. This is not an abstract fear for a writer like myself. When I finished The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, a friend who worked in publishing told me, don't get my hopes up too high because no one cares about African literature. I saw that every time I read a newspaper article that described Africa as hell or hellish or savage or brutal. 
I hear it now in Baldwin's words, who while full of generosity, are also there to provoke, to ask, how long can we keep denying each other? It should be obvious by now that the cost of doing so is too high. What we call political fiction is for me just fiction. If I wrote the story of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed couple living in a Victorian mansion on the shores of Connecticut, someone would claim that I had reimagined the immigrant experience, that I turned the immigrant experience upside down. There's another type of fiction that, doesn't, that I appreciate even more, and it's, I think, the one that I ask myself and the ones that I try to write these days. And it's not just the political fiction, it's the engaged fiction. And it's this fiction that has nothing to do with the politics of the left or the right, and everything to do with wanting to see and read and tell stories that avoid strangely or impossibly homogenous versions of the world. Stories that push our narratives out into difficult places where race and gender and class, where migration and economics and violence are more than just inconvenient realities that only some people have to face. When we talk about immigrant literature or ethnic literature, a part of me thinks really what we should be doing is put little warning labels on those books and say, warning, this book may contain political subjects. Because what we mean by political subjects are lives. The stories of people who are real or imagined that don't exist in isolation. About characters who not only look up at the stars, as Camus said, but at the unfamiliar face sitting across from them, hoping to find some form of recognition. After I left those soldiers in Eastern Congo, we drove a couple of yards down the same dirt road, and we got to the village that they were supposed to be protecting. And we huddled in a house with the elders of the village, who described for the next few hours how they had been pillaged and attacked over and over over the past few years. When I asked them why the soldiers who were only a few hundred yards away and the government that surrounded them didn't do anything to protect them, the, soldiers, the, the villagers had a very simple response. The soldiers outside were from a different part of the country. The people who ran the government were from a different part of the country. They were all from the same country, but it was something that existed only in name. One of the more radical and dangerous ideas I think about why we read and sometimes write books is that they might push us to move beyond the surface of our skin. Why else are we here if not to acknowledge the hard facts that communities and countries don't exist by mere proximity? They are forged, they are built, hour by hour, in opposition to the fact of our competing backgrounds and beliefs and why else are we here as readers and writers if not to admit that doing so involves more than just listening and tolerating one another? It means taking these hard leaps of the imagination. The type of leap that happens every time you sit down and you read a novel and you find that there you are, in Kampala, or in the Midwest, or in Victoria, England, or on the streets of Palm Springs, walking hand in hand with a man from Ethiopia. What if you look at closely enough? might just bear a striking resemblance to yourself. Thank you. And I believe we have time for questions, I hope. a question that I will, I will repeat all the questions out loud so everyone can hear them. Yes, I know that. Yes, um, Kamel Daoud. Yes, I am. Um, the question was if I was familiar with an Algerian novelist named Kamel Daoud, um, who had just published a book called The Merceau Invest Investigation, um, which picks up from Camus, The Stranger, which tells the, tells the story from the point of view of the brother of the Algerian, of the unnamed Arab um, in The Stranger Who's Killed. I have, and um, we, just, we did a talk together in New York a few months ago. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, the question is, is that an, an attempt to um, to talk about the discrimination faced by Arabs? Um, I, you know, I'd say with, with, within Kamel's book, what he's really interested about is um, more than anything is portraying a growing intolerance inside of Algeria. Um, and if anything, trying to sort of, we have sometimes a very limited idea of what these societies and cultures look like, especially when they exist far away, and especially the way we have a conversation around um, around it the Muslim world um, in a sort of obscenely large phrasing like that. Um, and what Kamel is doing, I think more importantly in that book, is trying to show that the greatest threats that are happening inside of these increasingly intolerant societies happens to the people inside of them. You know, so Kamel is a very engaged and brilliant journalist. And the panel that I was talking about at the beginning of the story was actually with him in Algeria um, and was feeling like the society that he was living in was growing increasingly restrictive. Um, increasingly intolerant, and we worry about it from our end here about the sort of growing rise of of these conservative conservative Islamic states. Um, but the people who live inside of these countries are deeply, deeply worried about them as well, much more so than we are, and they're the ones who bear um, the greatest um, costs of that transformation, the greatest burden of that increasingly radical society. So. Anyone else? Uh, Don Nola once said that a novelist should, in some degree, be a bad citizen. Um, mm -hmm. With your role as a journalist and a novelist, do you see the two intersecting in a political way? Or well, how do you see the future of the novel yeah. as far as novels having an impact on culture? Um, the question was Don Nola once said that novels should be bad citizens. Um, you know, I think, I, think there's, I think there's a different. So like I agree, like it's important just to be more and more blunt about the way and the reason why you write and the approach that you have towards fiction as being very different. And I think there's, as, as a novelist, like I'm deeply worried and engaged by the very aesthetic of the novel, right? The quality and the craft that you bring to a sentence, the ability for those sentences to be beautiful and to express complex ideas. Um, but I also really believe that the novel um, and literature in general becomes and is and should be also a way of deeply engaging the world. Of, of moving beyond just the kind of like set of sometimes hermetically sealed ideas and aesthetic concerns and pushing those same concerns out into a larger world to say, you know what, um, for me being any, a, a good citizen, I'm, I'm definitely not in any meaning, in any way, I'm a terrible person. Um, <laughs> but I think when, if anything, in, when I write, I try to be a better one, right? I try to be the person who's um, who doesn't have a definition or an idea of what's right or wrong, but wants to actively try to look out beyond myself and see what, what is happening in the world and how I can fold that into narrative, how I can fold that into an aesthetic experience for the reader um, that pushes them into these like more difficult, sometimes more beautiful places than they could get to. I think there's a lot to be said about great writers that just also have a small body, and a small sounds pejorative in that sense, but writers who, have a concern with like language or just who are concerned about the aesthetics of the novel. I love those stories as well. I think those are great things. But for me, what's, um, what's increasingly important is to make sure that I can kind of get out into the world actively um, as a journalist and then also as a novelist as well. Yes? After your novel about the flood refused to get written, who were the novelists who made you think that being a écrivain engagé in this literature was possible? Um, that's a great question. Um, the question was after 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 my first wonderful novel. Um, okay, wait, what was the name of it? All the all the points in between. When I talked about the pretentious title. I wasn't joking. Um, what novelists made me think about um, being able to sort of go do the, the type of fiction that I do now. Um, I would, it's not, it's a mix. Some writers like V.S. Naipaul um, would definitely be very top of the, I'd say V.S. Naipaul and Saul Bellows were enormously important. Um, I'd also say Virginia Woolf. Um, you know, there's, um, Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers, right? Like that's an enormously important move in narrative, right? It's a huge step in saying like, look, I'm gonna take this character and make these sort of seemingly domestic concerns and raise it up to the level of like art. Um, that was a very important for me in the same way that it was to be able to write the name of a character and have him be Saifa Salazi, giving him an Ethiopian name and saying, 
this man actually is worthy of being part of a narrative, of being part of a literary discourse that oftentimes I didn't have, that I was anxious about including him in. Um, Marilyn Robinson, um, who I think for me did something very similar in housekeeping, where she took this very small like group of people, put them in a very strange, bizarre place, and wrote beautifully about it in a way that elevated it into something that became <coughs> so sublime. Um, Yes, um, well, because it, because it should be, I guess. Um, and, and I think that becomes some of the reasons. What was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was about Tyler Nessie's coats uh, between the world, um, between the world and between the world and me. Um, which I think also comes from, from a phrasing from um, Dubois in The Souls of Black Folks, um, where he talks about, um, I'm going to forget the line. Um, but you know, oftentimes, th that book is, is, it is a difficult book. and. Um, and sometimes we tend to want to shy away from difficult narrative because we, um, I think part of it is because we've, we've decided that like stories, some stories are supposed to provide us this type of pleasure, some stories are supposed to provide us with other things. And, um, and for me, that book is a great nece necessity. You know, it's a book that, that says um, the violence and discrimination that African Americans have, ex have experienced in America takes a very physical reality and we have to be able to experience it and read about it and talk about it. Otherwise, we don't actually move forward, right? We actually have, we, we, we pretend like, we've have, like we're having really great conversations, not only about race, but about class, about gender. Um, but oftentimes, we, we're not, because we're afraid to actually push ourselves into those very uncomfortable spaces. And for me, writing about, um, writing about immigration, writing about migrants in a ways that times people feel like can be a little bit melancholic or not very funny. Um, is part of an attempt to do the same thing, to say, well, it's not that these stories should make you feel sad or depressed, but that they should ask you to, to sit in an uncomfortable space because the world's, the world's more interesting that way, isn't it? Like, it's more alive. It's more beautiful to me when I know that there's something difficult that I haven't had a chance to know about yet. When I know about it, yes, I'm not like jumping up and down, but I do feel, I feel more complete as a human being. Uh, I feel more alive, definitely, and I would rather have that than feel happy. Um, I'm going to ask something. I, I write up, uh, and I, I am also a great reader, and um, I, I get sort of teased in my book club because I write the core story. This is about our humanity, and if we don't break away from the, and, and I, I'm hungry to know everybody on the soul basis, and that means what is troubling us, because if I know and I love African writers. A lot of African women are writing, and yeah. they're writing that. I mean, I just love when people write about the human condition because I think that brings us more into a oneness or an understanding. I mean, I just hunger for more. Just, yeah. yeah. So I'm on your side. <laughs> you know, and I want to write. I, I'm, I'm telling you what I want, but I love being here. It's just like the best. But I want to tell the future who we were. And I, I, I want us to awaken to, to the suffering. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, yeah. Let's, let's leave some happiness in there, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where did you grow up outside of the house? I grew up in Forest Park, Illinois, and then uh, public school? private school. And if anybody knows Oak Fenwick High School. Um, what am I reading right now? Um, I am reading, <laughs> I have a five and a six year old, so I'm reading <laughs> Frog and Toad, uh, which let me tell you, it gets better and better. Uh, I only read the one, but there's actually four Frog and Toad books, and like the number three and the four, <laughs> I say that facetiously, but I'm actually being pretty sincere. Um, um, and I'm reading, I'm reading a lot of books that actually are about to come out, um, so I'm reading a, um, friends who are novelists who have books that are, that are going to be published. And there's a great book about screening Jay Hopkins by my friend Mark Benelli that'll be published in April. Um, uh, I just forgot the name of my other friend's book that's sitting in my back, but it's great. His name is Manuel Gonzalez. Yes? Forgive my ignorance, 
conflict was the conflict in eastern Congo between the Tutsis and Hutus? And if so, why did you not mention them, their names? Um, well, the conflict actually wasn't between Tutsis and Tutsis. It, um, the conflict in Rwanda was about that. Once the rebels cross over into eastern Congo, the conflict was much more about the instability of, of these two nations, right? The rebels had moved into eastern Congo. They wanted to go back and take over the Rwandan government. They never were going to. So they just stayed for the next 15 years and destabilized the country. They weren't really fighting for anything after a point. Um, the fighting became because there was nowhere else to go. Um, they were movement in exile, and they stayed in exile. Um, yeah. I, what, well, the question was, what will my kids come up with? Um, I don't know, because they've got, they were born in Paris. They have a French mother who was raised in the countryside of Bordeaux, um, an Ethiopian American father. Um, what I want them to be able to have is the ability to feel like they don't have to choose. And I think that's the sort of problem. Yeah, or not, or just, just to realize that, you know, oftentimes we have this very narrow idea of what our identity can or should be. We sort of ask these questions about, like, where are you from, expecting one singular answer, like, I am X and I am Y. And some people have that. Some people very much belong to one particular tribe. Um, I think increasingly that's not the case. Um, and I don't want my children to feel like they have to live it and confine themselves into these various, very specific and oftentimes very narrow categories of what their identity is. I want them to feel like they're equally a part of all these things. Like, I feel I'm equally American as I am Ethiopian. Um, I feel like no one has the right to tell me I'm neither one of those things. So if I'm in Ethiopia, I'm going to be Ethiopian. You can tell me I'm not. Um, you can tell me that I'm not American or that I'm less American. Um, but I don't think anybody should, yeah, grab that, have that authority. I think there's time for one one last question. Or no. Thank you.